Starcraft, Chevy High Performance, some Ford magazines, Lowrider, just a ton of great legacy magazines. And they just took them outside and shot them in the back of the head, and that was it. But if there's a good side to all of that, it's that I've been going full bore on the Horsepower Monster YouTube channel, and I'm really loving it. Thanks again for watching. Anyhow, one of my last projects for Carcraft was this Mustang. It's a 99 GT. It's the first year of the new edge body style. And I was able to pick it up for 1500 bucks because I had a busted transmission. This is the Pro Dino shop in Fort Mill, South Carolina. I normally like to do my own work on my cars, but this engine swap involves a lot more than just mechanical, as you'll see. So I turned to Pro Dino's lead mechanic, Paul Connor, for help. He is an absolute wizard when it comes to anything bearing a blue oval. This project is nothing new for Connor. He does this sort of stuff every day. And he just started ripping into the Mustang right away. He said he'd have the old engine out before lunch. So I asked him what the biggest hurdle would be. Uh, wiring. Yeah, everything else goes in this, uh, pretty much bolts right in. Even the motor mounts are the same bolt pattern. But it's getting everything wired up. <laughs> Edit that part up. <laughs> uh, getting everything wired up is the uh, definitely the the biggest challenge in this. Swap. Another big advantage a shop like this has is a lift. The Mustang's engine most easily comes out of the car by unbolting the suspension and K-member and dropping it right out the bottom. That means doing the swap with the car sitting on jack stands in your driveway or your shop simply isn't practical. Still, it can be done if you're determined. Unfortunately, there's not a single kit with everything you need to do the swap. Connor says he's seen this project frustrate a lot of guys and it's rarely the big things that end up biting them. It's all the little problems that pile up into one big headache. Fittings for power steering, um, air conditioner lines, stuff like that. Like they make the brackets and the AC pumps and the power steering pumps uh, to retrofit to the Coyote motor, but a lot of times they don't give you the, the little details that you need to actually make it work. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the the biggest thing that somebody at 200 trying to do in their garage doesn't have access to all that much, so it would take longer to make it happen. All right, here we go. With everything unplugged and unbolted, you can see how the car just lifts right up and over the engine and front suspension. This is a QA1 performance suspension setup but it works the same if everything is still stock. Amazing how quickly Paul Connor at Prodano got this engine out. 
He had started about 8.30 in the morning by 11.30? 11? Like Had it out. Came out transmission, engine and all. Basically just unbolted the K-member, dropped it out the bottom. And now what are you doing, Paul? Uh, stripping the motor down so we can get it off the K-member. Junk. Sorry, ever-growing junk pile. Now Connor pulls the intake manifold to make it easier to lift the engine. Unbolts the old 4.6 modular with the transmission still attached from the K-member and pulls everything out from underneath the car to make it easier to work on. We're keeping the 5-speed T5 transmission so that sticks around. I've also already swapped in a new clutch and flywheel from ATI. So far, the performance of that clutch has been excellent, and it's rated for 485 foot-pounds of torque, which exceeds the Coyote's 400 foot-pound rating, so it gets swapped into the new engine too. As Connor already mentioned, the bolt patterns for the 4.6 modular and the Coyote are exactly the same, so the T5 bolts right up. While the engine was out in the open, Connor and Curtis Sylvester, that's him on the left, bolt up the new long tube headers from BBK. By the way, these headers are great for a Coyote swap into a Mustang like this, and the quality is phenomenal. But by necessity, the headers wrap around the bell housing. That means once it's in the car, there is no pulling the transmission without first loosening the headers on at least one side of the engine. Be warned. If you think this could be an issue for you, you may want to go with shorty headers. Pile of parts for the Mustang is growing. Here's the old 4.6. I don't know what we're gonna do with it yet. Maybe somebody on Craigslist. It turned out Connor had a buddy who he's helping with a Mustang build, and he could use the motor, so I gave it to him. I'd rather help out friends than worry about squeezing out every last dollar, so that was an easy decision. All right, things are going well, but we've hit our first real hiccup. Got the, uh, the BBK headers on. You'll see all that, and the engine dropped right down into the motor mounts up until the point that we got right here. And Ford's fancy oil cooler hits the steering box. I mean, the rack and pinion. Ford's oil cooler hits the rack and pinion. Of course, Paul has a solution for this. He says if we don't anything, need anything as fancy as steering, we can just do without it. So the oil cooler gets ditched and the oil filter will spin directly onto the block. Okay, we've run into our first real issue of the build. If you can see here, before we get the engine all the way down on the motor mounts, the, uh, the oil pan is hitting the steering rack. As you can see it right there. We still have a little bit of a ways to go on the motor mounts. There we go. I don't know if you can see that. There we go. This also was an easy fix. We just put some spacers between the K-member and the motor mounts to raise the engine about three-eighths of an inch. There was a lot more boring, finicky wiring and plumbing stuff involved, but finally we were ready to lower the Mustang back on over the engine. It's a tight fit, and we had to remove the intake runner manifold control at the back of the intake manifold to make it all work. The intake runner control just fits past the firewall, but it hits this flange here. But removing it really isn't a big deal anyway, and then the K-member suspension bolted right back up. Unfortunately, I was concentrating on photos for the CarCraft article, so I'm missing a lot of video from here until the dyno session, but I wanted to include a few photos of parts that might be interesting to you. To make room in the engine compartment, we had to relocate the battery to the trunk but that helps with weight distribution anyway. We just used a Moroso one size fits all battery relocation kit 
and bolted it into the trunk so everything is secure. Here, Connor finishes up fabricating a ground for the battery that will bolt to the frame. To fit the Coyote into the SN95 frame, the BBK headers actually wrap around the steering shaft, so the shaft has to be reinstalled after the engine and headers are fully bolted in. The stock fuel pump can't keep up with the extra fuel needed by the Coyote at full song, so we ditched it and added an Aeromotive Phantom intake dual fuel pump setup, which is awesome. It can handle well over my final target of 700 horsepower if I ever get around to adding a supercharger or turbos. The two pumps are managed by a stage controller from 4 Innovations. We struggled with a nice sanitary mounting position and wound up sticking it to the inside of the rear fender in the trunk with double sided tape. The controller weighs practically nothing so it works fine and the trunk panels, once they're installed, hide it and keep anything from hitting it. The new computer is mounted on the passenger side of the engine compartment. The Moroso tank you see right behind it on the strut tower is the power steering overflow tank. We also mounted the new fuse box near it, just behind the passenger side front fender. It's also protected by the inner fender once it's installed. The old computer has to stick around because it also controls body functions, so getting them to work together was a bit of a trick. Connor sciences it all out and somehow made it work. It's all voodoo to me. At this point, I might as well have gone on a donut run for all the help I was doing during this part of the build. The engine is a second generation Coyote and the throttle is drive by wire. A new pedal comes with the wiring harness, but to get it to bolt up you need to buy or fabricate an adapter. We used a machined aluminum adapter that we found online. Normally I tell you who makes it right about now, but unfortunately I can't remember and I can't find it in my notes. Now you can see why the battery had to be moved to the trunk. The stock airbox for the Coyote doesn't come close to fitting into this Mustang. But this intake from JLT Performance worked perfectly. It's a snug fit and goes right where the battery used to be. And here's a look at the completed installation. You can see the computer on the left where the original airbox used to reside. Just behind the radiator is an aluminum catch can from Canton that I'm using as a coolant overflow tank. The radiator, by the way, is a direct drop in from Fluidine and I'm using twin 12 inch electric radiator fans from Spall with a radiator shroud that I fabricated for this project. It's a bit of overkill for the Coyote, but again, everything is specced out to cool an engine producing 700 horsepower. Even after removing the stock oil cooler, I ran into another issue with the oiling system. I don't know if it works on a stock setup, but both the QA1 sway bar and the oil filter wanted to occupy the same space. To make it all work, I used a remote oil filter kit from Hedman that moved the oil filter up inside the inner fender. This also gives me room to use a much larger oil filter, which I definitely appreciate. Okay, the Project Fake Snake engine is in. And I figured you probably want to see it run, so let's give it a shot here. The gauges still aren't hooked up, so we're using the OBD2 gauges to tell where everything is. Let's listen to it. Obviously, we still have no mufflers hooked up and need a little bit of tuning. The, uh, I think the, uh, all the airflow from the JLT cold air intake is throwing off the computer a little bit. Um, but once we get the tuning done, I think it's going to be going great. The car definitely did need tuning. After getting the exhaust installed and putting 300 easy miles on the Mustang, I took it back to Pro Dino where owner Dan Desio put it on his dyno for a good custom tune.
Dan doesn't do prepackaged tunes. Everything is specific to his own car. So he worked his magic, taking advantage of all the custom work Connor had done and squeezed out an astounding 432.48 horsepower at 6,500 RPM and 396.86 foot-pounds of torque. Given a 10% power loss through the drivetrain, we estimate that this means about 470 horsepower at the crank, which is about 40 horsepower better than the crate motor was originally rated for. With the Coyote up front, this Mustang feels like a different car. 432 horsepower will do that. Now this faded yellow paint is still as ugly as homemade sin, but the car is still a blast to drive. Compared to a 2018-2019 Mustang, the SN95 with the all-aluminum Coyote engine in it is about 500 pounds lighter, 3,200 pounds to 3,700 pounds. So that's hard to beat too. Now if you don't mind, I'm gonna continue my drive. If you've made it this far, please like and subscribe, it really helps. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.